In this world of paper-thin screens, high-resolution cameras, crystal-clear audio, and technology that practically blends into everyday life, I find myself playing with old mediums, formats, and ideas. It might be out of boredom, the newness of this technology having worn off years ago, but the more I look back, the more I gravitate to certain technology, the hybrids, if you will. A time right before, during, or after a transition period where the best of both the analog and digital worlds met in a very volatile market. These pieces of technology, the first generation or sometimes the only generation, have such distinct and unique characteristics that are almost impossible to capture and replicate even today. But before we take a deep dive, let's get some of the obvious definitions out of the way. Analog. Relating to or using signals or information represented by a continuously variable physical quantity, such as spatial position, voltage, etc. Digital. Describing electronic technology that generates, stores, and processes data in terms of two states, positive and non-positive. Positive is expressed or represented by the number one and non-positive by the number zero. Converting analog mediums to digital data involves sampling the continuous variables in smaller pieces that can be more or less representative of the original signal. Take this terribly drawn curve for instance, sorry. If I wanted to give someone across the world a copy of this analog medium, I could ask them to place a piece of paper next to it and try to draw it as best as possible. But this is extremely hard to do accurately and over time the copies start to look less and less and less like the original drawing. This is a pretty good analogy of making copies of cassette tapes in analog audio format and represents something called generation loss. The more copies made of the original signal, the less the new signal resembles the original. You can do this at home with a couple VCRs and a ton of patience. Here's a video someone else made. In contrast, what I could do is pick an arbitrary length and height and cut this curve up into sections matching these dimensions. I could then label each box or pixel, if you can see where I'm heading with this, a coordinate on the X and Y axis. I can then assign every empty box a zero and every box that intersects the curve a one. Assuming that someone has the same exact grid as me, I can write down the coordinates of the boxes that intersect the curve and they can draw the curve themselves accurately every single time with no generation loss. This in essence is an analog to digital conversion. You might be looking at this curve and are also feeling like it doesn't represent the original drawing. You might think it looks blocky. This is due to the low resolution of the digital data. A device's resolution is the smallest interval of space measurable. Our grid here has half inch by half inch boxes, so to obtain a better representation of the original curve, we can decrease the size of the boxes to a quarter inch by a quarter inch, thus improving our resolution. Now it looks more like the original drawing. The smaller the boxes, the less noticeable the individual pixels are and the smoother the curve appears. When technology started advancing in the synthesizer industry, it became cheaper and more practical to generate a digital representation of an analog waveform. Analog synthesizers had many issues, most notably the pitch of the note would change as a function of temperature. As the temperature of the components rose, the resistance of the components increased, which changed the control voltage and thus the pitch. Digital oscillators didn't have that problem. They were synced to a clock frequency and the waveform never changed in pitch or amplitude due to the physical properties of the components used. But early digital oscillators had a low resolution, so to speak, meaning they produced waveforms that weren't exactly a smooth replica of a sawtooth wave, for instance. The resolution of the waveform was typically 8 bits, which effectively gave a cold and harsh sound. But the filters were analog, meaning the cold, harsh waveforms could be smoothly shaped and stacked to create rich, warm texture. One of the first hybrid synthesizers to hit the market, and my personal favorite, was the Insonic ESQ-1. It had waveforms which were both synthetically generated and ROM samples. Let's have a listen to a single sawtooth and then some examples of absolutely wild sounds you can make on the synth.
The stable tuning of digital oscillators is just one example of the benefit of analog to digital conversions. In June of 2008, the United States made the switch from analog to digital broadcast television, and gone were the days of repositioning rabbit ear antennas to get a slightly less fuzzy looking television signal. Let's pretend you wanted to watch a show on channel 5, but you kept getting a snowy picture. The snow was caused by interference as these waveforms were at a frequency of 79 MHz, which means 79 million cycles per second. It is very difficult to receive a raw signal that high in frequency without any interference. I got it! However, when that signal is sent over as digital data, you don't get the snowy interference of a rogue radio frequency. At worst, the antenna receives only part of the data and ends up displaying a blocky looking picture. Now the part about digital versus analog that is often a bit confusing is that all electromagnetic signals are analog, whether it's light, electricity, radio waves, or, well, not really sound waves. Sound waves are kind of an analog pressure wave. Anyways, analog data can be converted into digital data, which is then sent over an analog medium to be decoded back into analog data by the receiver. That's a lot. Let's take this tape player as an example. It transmits sound waves across a physical space, which is an analog medium. I will be transmitting slow scan television, which is digital data, since the color of each pixel in an image can be represented by a digital tone. The digital tone is then recorded onto the tape. I can then play this tape back into a program which converts the analog sound waves back into digital pixels, creating a picture on the other end. A big innovation in the digital industry these days is affordable solid state storage relying on flash memory. But several years ago, hard disks with spinning platters were often the only option for consumers, and before that, it was tape storage. Some of the weirdest and most innovative storage mediums came during the transition from analog to digital video and still photography one of which is the storage of still video images on video floppy disks. Basically, the camcorder would capture one analog NTSC video frame, or PAL, depending on where you were, and store it on a spinning disk of magnetic film. When watching it back, it looks almost as if you paused a VHS tape and are looking at a single frame. Personally, I love the style. Now, these devices such as the Canon RC250 are very difficult to find in working condition, and the video floppy disks seem to decay rather quickly but I do have a JVC camcorder that does effectively the same thing with a snapshot button. It stores one frame of NTSC video onto compact VHS tape. Here are some very cinematic, not at all embarrassing shots of my friends. Within the next few years, digital storage became small enough for cameras. Apple introduced the QuickTake 100 in 1994, which stored 640x480 image files on EEPROM memory. But my personal favorite innovation came in 1997 with the Sony Mavic. The original model was an FD5, and I have an FD83 here from 1999. This thing stores images and video on floppy disks. You can store roughly six 1024 by 768 still JPEG images or 15 seconds of 320 by 240 16 frames per second video. Fantastic. This is what 320 by 240 video at 16 frames a second looks like on a Sony Mavica from 1999. It probably looks terrible, probably looks like a Super 8 footage with a lot of JPEG artifacts, but this was your technology back in the day. Yeah, so upon further inspection, that was 160 by 112, so I'm going to refilm that. I changed the settings. This time it is for sure 320 by 240. You probably don't even notice a difference. The audio quality is also terrible. I don't know what that bitrate is, but terrible stuff. 32 kilobits a second. That is almost as good as my uh, landline. Not quite. I have to say though, the photos really have a mid-2000s college party type of vibe, which is exactly what I used it for. I'm a fan. The storage mediums weren't the only parts of cameras and camcorders to make the transition from analog to digital. The method of capturing the image did as well. From the 1930s to the 1980s, video cameras used an analog cathode ray tube to capture light and convert it to a video signal. Essentially, light was focused onto a photosensitive screen and then an electron gun scanned the brightness of the screen to produce a video signal. We can demonstrate this with our next piece of tech, the Panasonic Omnimovie PV220D. 
The PV220D came out in 1986 and was the second all-in-one Omnimovie VHS camcorder, its predecessor being the PV200D. The 220 featured a smoother, sleeker design and was the last camcorder in the series to feature a Nuvicon tube as the image sensor. Its controls were very limited, offering auto and manual focus, date and time display, white balance adjust, 12 times manual, and a very slow automatic zoom. Very slow. And a wonderful swivel head viewfinder. So what does the video from a Nuvicon tube look like? Well, it's truly one of a kind look. The colors are extremely washed out and the bright lights have a streaking effect due to the photosensitive plate within the tube. Combine that with the fuzziness of VHS and you get a very dated looking image. The PV300 came out a year or so later and featured a digital charged coupled device image sensor. When exposed to light, different areas of the CCD conduct a charge proportional to the brightness of the light hitting that spot. The charge is then measured and stored as digital data which is reconstructed into an image file. This greatly improved the sharpness, clarity, and color reproduction of VHS footage. In my opinion, the best and one of the last VHS camcorders for home consumers to ever hit the market is the Sharp Slim Cam. The Slim Cam was all about automatic controls, and they were pretty darn good for the time. Coming with a 12 times optical zoom lens, auto and manual focus, and fade in and out to white ability, it was pretty bare bones, but the sleek, slim, and lightweight design more than made up for it. Its one lux minimum illumination made this camcorder fit for the darkest of situations, and weighing less than 5 pounds made it easy to carry anywhere. But just as CCDs and digital cameras were coming in, analog video was slowly going out. Video 8 was analog tape in a smaller format, followed by Hi8 and Digital 8. Mini DV was a much smaller tape that could store 480 lines of lossy compressed video but with uncompressed audio. My favorite camcorder from this time is the Panasonic DVX100. The DVX100 made digital video much more affordable and available to the average consumer. Released in 2002, it was the first consumer affordable digital camcorder capable of recording video at 24 progressive frames per second. With analog video, frames were captured as two sets of odd and even lines displayed sequentially. When viewed on a modern day flat screen, you can see combing artifacts in areas of motion. Progressive video displays each full frame sequentially, allowing for a smoother, natural look. Progressive video frames could be extracted from the tape over Firewire, making this the camcorder of choice for independent filmmakers. It featured three CCD sensors, one for red, green, and blue. It offered fantastic manual controls such as zoom, shutter speed, exposure, aperture, and white balance, as well as a large comfortable eyepiece and swivel viewfinder on the side. The resulting footage is interesting. The colors are vibrant, the image is a little bit blocky, yet the picture retains the softness of film. It is my new favorite camera. I hope you enjoyed this look at my collection of analog and digital tech. I'm excited to see where we move next as a society. It seems like the transition is not so much analog to digital anymore, but more along the lines of in real life to augmented virtual reality. I remember around 2010 when Google Glass was all the rage and then the project ended up being shelved because um, it looked weird and you couldn't do much and nobody really cared about it. But now you have pieces of tech like the Oculus Rift, which has really changed the game in terms of video games. I'm excited to see what happens next. It's a weird time in the world for sure, and because of it, my content is going to vary a bit, but I will be uploading much more often. So check out my social media and my Etsy store. Please stay safe, wash your hands, and don't panic. And I will see you in the next one.